Today we're going to be making Parisa scallops. Then we're going to do some pepper tuna and risotto with butternut squash and sausage. But when it comes to fish, there is no other place rather than this to get it fresh and right. Come with me. Parisa's scallops. Who is Parisa? Parisa is the lovely bride of my nephew Andrew. And once when she came to the house for dinner, I made the scallops in her honor. And I told her, if you like them, and if you give me permission, I would like to place them on my next television series. And she said, yes, I give you permission. So here we are. They're very simple to make, and they're very, very tasty. Now, scallops, these are sea scallops. One of the biggest mistakes that people do once they get them at the store is get them, get them out of the wrap, and immediately cook them. Scallops have a nice bit of moistness in them, especially if they're fresh. So what I suggest, right before you cook them, to take a moment with paper towel to dry them on all sides, the bottom and the top. Why do we do this? What we want to do is to have a nice and dry. We'll just put some salt and pepper on them later when we cook them. So once they hit the hot oil, they will not splatter all the way around. And also, it will allow us to get the wonderful little crust that we want to get at the bottom. I have a pan right now sauteing the oil, cooking the oil, and I'm using extra light olive oil because I can really push it to very high temperature. Let's take a look at the sausages that I'm using. I'm using sausages that are called hot links. You can do this, or you can use Italian-style sausages. Kielbasa would work very well. Anything that you want. I like these because they have a little bit of a kick into them, and they really add to the flavor in a significant fashion. Let me show you how is that I like to dice them so that you'll understand. I prefer them this way because I like small pieces to make the whole dish look very elegant. But you don't need to go with small pieces. You can cut them in round if you want, or you can cut them in larger pieces. But this is the way that I like to do it. Let me show you how. I'm going to put this piece right here. So I take the sausage, and then using a knife, I go like this to the side. Once we get this part done, using the tip of the knife, this is to do it, so for those of you who are afraid of knives, you need not to. And I score it to go all the way along to make it into the strips that I will ultimately turn into small dies. So we'll move this aside. Now that we have this, this is all that you need to do. You see how small it is? This is gonna cook quite quickly. It will brown and it will bring out all the enhanced flavor that we are looking for. So this is the part that you want to be most attentive with. Once it's done, I use my picker upper. Actually, it's a pastry cutter, but I nominated it, picker upper. And everybody laughs when I say that. It's a tool that I love using like this. The oil in the pan is extra light olive oil. It's nice and hot. And what we're going to do, we're going to add the sausage that I cooked. What you want to do at this point is to cook the sausage on medium-high heat and to just pick up a little bit of browning. The aroma is wonderful. As the sausage starts to cook in here, it picks up a little bit of browning and two things are taking place. The sausages are releasing the juices straight into the pan, really giving us a wonderful base. And that particular bit, with the oil that's been mixed together with the olive oil and the natural oil that they have in them, is going to be at the base of our sauce. But also, it will allow us to cut the onions. Now, when you add the onions, I am suggesting you that you mince them as fine as you can. What we want is for these onions to almost melt into the sauce, so that when finally you bite into it, you can taste the presence, but there will be like cream in your mouth. So here we go with the onions. You do not want to do this on very high heat. You want to do this on medium heat and do this for the next five minutes. And while the onions are cooking, the next thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to add pieces of garlic. And they're cut nice and thick. I'm treating these pieces of garlic almost the same size of the sausages. Why do I like to cut them thick? There is a reason for this. And as the brown on the outside will still self stuffed on the inside. And a piece of garlic eventually will move across your tongue. And at that moment, most people are scared. They go, oh my gosh, garlic is going to ruin my breath. One of the things that you need to be aware about is that garlic, the reason why people have garlic breath is not because of the garlic itself, but it's because of the fact that the garlic has been burned. Burnt garlic is very difficult to digest. Garlic treated this way, instead, is like a candy. It's wonderful. Not only you will be able to eat enormous amount of garlic, but nobody will ever say to you, you have garlic breath. We go with the peas now. Mmm, I love this. 
cook this for a few moments. You notice that the peas that I'm using right here are frozen peas. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I want you to be aware that at home, if you don't have access to fresh peas, frozen peas will work wonderfully well. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to deglaze everything, a little bit of eye heat with some wine. I'm using Marsala in this case, but you can use any kind of wine you want. If you don't like Marsala, go with some white wine that will work wonderfully well for you. Cook at high heat enough until the wine reduces perfectly well. Next addition that we're gonna make is the chicken stock. And remember, if you wanna give a different taste to this whole process, instead of using wine, you could actually use brandy. Brandy is a fabulous addition. It takes it to a different place, but it's absolutely wonderful. Now, let's let this bring to a boil. Once it reaches a boil, we're gonna lower it down to a pretty agitated simmer on medium heat until the peas are cooked all the way through. The sauce has reduced to perfection, as you can see, is nice and thick. Now we're almost ready to go. The next thing that we're going to do, we're going to cook the scallops. The oil is nice and hot. What I have done, I've salted and peppered the scallops. We're gonna put them down into the hot oil and we're not going to move them until they form a nice little crust. Now we're gonna turn our scallops to the other side. One thing that I like to do is to add a little bit of butter into it and do a technique that is known as a rosé. This is beautiful. We're ready to go. All I need to do now is to plate it all. I'm gonna turn both burners off and we start first and foremost with our sauce. Take the sauce and what I like to do is to place it in the middle, just like this. It's on this bed of peas and spicy sausages that we'll place our scallops. The cooking time of your scallops will always vary depending on the size that you have. Scallops are very rich in taste. And this is exactly what I strive for. This color that you have on the top is exactly what you want to go for. So remember, super hot oil and don't touch them for at least a minute and a half, two minutes until they pick this up. And this indeed is my personal masterpiece dedicated to Parisa. Scallops alla Parisa. And here you are. So, have you ever wondered what is the easiest way to peel a clove of garlic? Let me show you. Take a clove of garlic, still with the skin on, put it into a bowl of hot water, and let it sit in there for about three to four minutes. Then take it out and start peeling it, just like this. And this is how you peel a clove of garlic. Next, Nick shows us how to prepare risotto with sausage, butternut squash, and peas. Risotto with sausage, butternut squash, and peas. I love this. Why? Because this reminds me of some of the best moments of my youth. I'll tell you the story as I go along. Let's get started. In the pan, right away, what I've done, I browned some Italian sausage. I went with sweet sausage. You can use spicy sausage if you want to, which is what I prefer, but my wife doesn't. And once it gets a nice brown color like this, is when we start adding the other ingredients. Now, let's take a focus on what we have in here. The oil that has accumulated at the bottom is not just oil, it's a lot of the juices from the sausages. We want to make sure that we incorporate this into the risotto in a way that doesn't make it greasy. And this is when the onions come in. Finely chopped onions, as we add them to it, they're gonna pick up this flavor. And what I'm doing, in spite of the fact that this is a non-stick pan, by stirring it around, you will see the sausages changing color the color that you see is not just the sausage is cooking, but it's the flavors that are absorbing. Together with the sausage, the next thing that we want to do 
is add the garlic. Because of the fact that this is going to be something that I cook over a long period of time, risotto in general figure from beginning to end will take you a good 30 minutes. It is not something that you want to slow down with because you need to do it on a fairly lively fire, but not so hot that it's like a boiling, but I would say a medium high heat, minimum. But you want to gently coddle the risotto into submission. I like to say that because eventually the risotto will do what you want it to do. If you undercook the risotto, the rice becomes too hard. If you overcook the risotto, the, ha the rice is too soft. But I must tell you, between the 25 to 30 minutes is the magic zone where the risotto is perfect. Once we add the garlic, together with the onions, once you do this at home, you want to cook this for about five minutes on medium heat. Then crank up the heat once again, and we go with the addition of the other ingredients. And here is the butternut squash. The butternut squash, I cut it in fine dice. Cutting it in fine dice is very important because I find that when the pieces are too big, first they're difficult to bite into. And that's one thing that I don't like. I always like for food to be easy to eat. In this way also, it cooks quicker and it melts straight into your mouth. And when it melts into your mouth, it's one of those things that just makes you happy because all the ingredients become creamy. And this is the finish of what it is that we're looking for to do. Let's stir this about so nothing burns in the bottom. Let me start my story. Why is it that I like this risotto so much? You have to realize that growing up in my family was kind of a challenge because the value of any member of our family was based on how they could cook. My father was the king. My mom was the queen. Risotto is not a Sicilian dish. It's something that my own father learned when he married my mom. My mom was from the Venice region. Uh, and my Aunt Buliti, for the first uh, 13 years of my life, uh, she lived with us in Palermo. To me, I consider her my second mom. I still, to this very day, I have nothing but a huge affection for her, who she is, how she is. And uh, as a matter of fact, I have a kind of a funny story to tell you. Uh, let me add the rice before I get started with things that really <laughs> don't matter much. The rice that we're using here is Arborio Superfino. Arborio is an Italian style of short grain rice. That's what you want to go with. If you go with any other kind of rice and you cannot find Arborio or Carnaroli, you can use short grain rice uh, of any other kind, but it will cook in much faster time. So Superfino and Arborio will take the good half hour. Why are we adding the rice right now? And why am I stirring the rice? This is what you should ask yourself. The reason why we're stirring the rice in here is that we want for the rice to toast up a little bit, to pick up all the flavors of what we are left behind. Pretty soon, we'll make the most important addition of the stock. Mmm, the aromas as I smell them right now are spectacular. You notice I've added no salt and no pepper. Why? The, there's plenty of salt, there's plenty of pepper in the sausages. I like to adjust the uh, salt and pepper to taste at the end. Here we go now with the stock. Nice, beautiful simmering stock. And you want to add a couple of ladle full until this starts to be incorporated by the rice. As this happens, what you want to do continuously is to stir the rice. And over a period of time, you will notice on this medium high heat, most of the stock will be absorbed. Now, while this is taking place, let me tell you why it is that I find my aunt so special and what was the story that I wanted to share with you. In spite of the fact that I called her aunt all my life, in my mind, she was my mom. I know, it doesn't make any sense, but when you're a little boy, this is what it is. And I remember I was in elementary school when I was uh, talking to some of my friends and uh, they explained to me that my aunt is my aunt and she cannot be my mom because I already have another mom and her name is Massimiliana. That was one of the saddest days of my life. And to this very day, I remember when I see her that I hug her and I tell her, Zia Buliti, non solo sei la mia zia, ma sei la mia seconda mamma, which means, and Buliti, not only you're my aunt, but you're my second mom. This is something which I absolutely adore. What's it got to do with risotto? This was the first dish that I cooked for her when I totally impressed her. Now, come back in here. You can see what happened as I was cooking. The stock has been absorbed nicely, and as you can see, has gone down into the bottom. The next thing that we're going to do is going to add some chopped sage, and the sage is going to bring a wonderful flavor. Once the sage is nicely incorporated into it, we go with the next addition of the stock. And here you go. You want to put just enough to cover the rice and then continue stirring until the stock is absorbed. Our stock has been absorbed. We're going to add some more. By the way, when you make this at home, if you want to give it even more flavor, at the beginning, when you add the onions together with the butternut squash and all the other ingredients, you can also add some wine. 
I will propose that if you do use wine, only use white wine. It's much more connected to these flavors. At this point, we're pretty much where we want, and I'm gonna start something known as the glassatura. I'm gonna add the cheese without stirring it, waiting for this to be absorbed. And I'm just gonna give it a couple of moments, and then I will continue with the adding of the stock and the stirring. We're just about 10, 12 minutes away. The next addition that we're gonna make is the peas. Not just for color, but for flavor. Frozen peas will do just fine. Actually, I almost favor them because they're nice and hard right now, right out of the refrigerator. But with the addition of the stock and the cooking that we're going to do, they're gonna come perfectly cooked at the end. Some more stock on top of it. We're gonna continue stirring. And in just a few more moments, we're gonna have our finished product, okay? To make this even better, five minutes before we serve it, when we still add it, we're gonna add a little bit more cream. The cream is gonna make it nice, dense, rich, and that's exactly what I want. And together with the cream, I'm gonna add some Parmigiano, and I'm gonna let this melt right into it. And then, a little bit more stock. By the time we get done, this thing is gonna be a masterpiece. A little bit more stirring, and we're almost done. We're done. The rice is exactly the consistency that I want. I personally like it done like this, a little bit loose. This technique, this look of the rice is called risotto all'onda. You can also go risotto asciutto. Asciutto means that almost has no liquid left altogether, but I find it to be much more appetizing, much more inviting when it has the onda effect. Now let's serve it. And this is the part that always at my house goes, ooh, ah. In the restaurants, when you go, this is what you get. My house, it's a little bit different. This is what you get. <laughs> there are a few more things that I like to do with it. Right before I serve it, I like to sprinkle some additional Parmigiano on top of it. Another great cheese to have, if you don't want to do with Parmigiano, is known as Grana Padano. And Grana Padano, in truth, is what I grew up because in the Veneto region, this is what they make instead of Parmigiano. So here we are, risotto with sausage, butternut squash and peas is a wonderful recipe, but to me, it's something that comes from my heart, my memory, and to my Aunt Buliti. Zia, ti voglio bene. Questo è per te. And there you are. Next, Nick shows us how to prepare peppered tuna, Sicilian style. Pepper tuna, Sicilian style, a combination between Sicilian cooking and Japanese cooking. How did this happen? I don't know, I love sushi, but I'll tell you more about it later. First thing is to start the sauce. The sauce is Sicily all the way. We started with a little bit of garlic, nice and thick. What we want for this garlic is to give the base to the flavors. The garlic, I like to get it just so that it starts to release its aroma, starts to almost brown, but not all the way through. The reason why it's cut nice and thick is because I want it to then finish braising into the liquid that we will add, pine nuts. Adding the pine nuts at this point allows us to slightly toast them. And toasting the pine nuts brings out another layer of flavor. But the flavor that I'm about to give you next, this is really what brings this home. Lemon, zester. The lemon zest in this is fabulous. The oils in the lemon, mm, I'm so sorry you cannot smell this aroma, but it is splendid, truly splendid. Then the secret weapon, mint, parsley, basil. A lot of other chefs usually like to add this at the very end. I find that when you add the fresh herbs at the beginning, and while you toast them like this, together with the other ingredients, the aroma, the flavors, the oil comes out, and the overall finish is even the much more powerful. Once this has picked up the right color, you just need a few, a few moments for that. The next thing we do is add the tomato sauce. Now, this is a technique for the tomato sauce. I like to put a spoon so that the fall of the tomato sauce into the pan does not cause any flashbacks. Very helpful this way. Here we are with this. To this, we're also going to add our raisins. These raisins have been basically marinated in water for about 20, 25 minutes, so they reacquire the uh, water. Then we squeeze them of the excess water and we add it to the sauce. So here we go. 
Now this is Sicily all the way. The last thing that I want to do is add a little bit of chicken stock, just so that as the sauce reduces, it does not become too thick. We're gonna bring this to a boil. Once it reaches a boil, we're gonna let it simmer until the sauce is completely finished. The next thing we're gonna do is our tuna. The tuna is the best part. This cut of tuna is called saku. As you can see, it's perfectly square. What makes this interesting? What makes it interesting to me is that it has the perfect shape and it has the very best. This is sashimi great tuna, the highest quality that you can possibly get. Don't be cheap. When it comes to this, invest in this because the flavor that you get out of this is out of this world. Now, next thing I'm going to do is to cut it into the amount that I want. Super sharp knife. When you cut the tuna exactly to where you want it, always pinch it. Pinching it basically makes it hard enough that it doesn't splinter. You see all these striations over here? If you're not careful, if you don't use a knife that's sharp enough, you may actually break it. This is too beautiful to be disrespectful to it. The next move that we're going to make is brushing the tuna with a little bit of olive oil on one side. Why? Because now we're going to pepper the tuna. Here I have a plate full of pepper. I'm going to take the tuna and immediately I'm going to drop it right on the pepper. I'm going to brush the other side. There is no salt needed in this. It's just pepper that presents its major flavor character. And here we go with that. The oil at this point is very, very hot. I'm going to make sure that it is ready to take the cooking. Here we go. You don't want to cook the tuna any more than 45 seconds to a minute per side. What we're trying to do is to sear the outside of the tuna so that as it sears, it makes a nice, wonderful crust with the pepper. This is going to be very spicy when you bite into it. We want to make sure that by the time we cook one side and then the next, what we have inside at this point is still the raw tuna in the middle and it makes it that much more beautiful. By searing the outside, the pepper will give us a wonderful crust and this is what we're shooting for. Now, we're going to turn the tuna. The tuna is ready to go. The one thing that I like to do now is to cut the tuna in the perfect pieces. To cut it in the perfect pieces, always I like to pinch it up a little bit like this and using a very sharp knife to cut it into very thick slices. You see the color on the inside? You see the slices how they are? This is absolutely beautiful. This is what you're aiming for, to adjust a little bit of raw on the inside. By pinching it this way, you make sure that the tuna does not fall apart. The sharper the knife is, the better it is. Voila, we are done. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is assemble the dish. How do we do this? I'm going to take the tuna and gently move it with the knife over here. And now I'm going to start painting. You say painting. Painting what? This dish. This dish that's so fantastic. First thing I do, I put the sauce. And what I like to do is to put enough sauce to cover the bottom of the plate. Just like this. You can see immediately the raisins in there cooking wonderfully well. The pine nuts, the garlic. One thing that I always like to do, just because this is such a pretty dish, like to wipe it clean and then we do the positioning of the tuna so one way that I like to do it is by stacking them up as if the little toys in a series of crisscross patterns just like this and the last piece of course the last piece it's always for the chef so here you are sushi Sicilian style <laughs> it inspired me and it's a wonderful wonderful dish easy to make and very flavorful and there you are. Thank you for joining me today. It was a, a unique opportunity for me to share some of the recipes from my family. You met Parisa and her scallops. You met my zia buliti uh, and her wonderful risotto. 
And you've seen a little invention that I came up with, with my passion for sushi, combined with an old-fashioned Sicilian sauce. It was an honor and a joy for me to share this with you. I hope that you'll enjoy it with your family and friends, and I look forward to see you next time, right here on Cooking with Nick Stellino. I need some sausage. Let me take a look at this uh, mild Italian. All right, it's a nice mild. You call time. it mild, I call it sweet all the time. By the way, what's the difference between mild and spicy? Our sausages are exactly the same recipe. For the hot, we just add more chili flakes. Okay. And two, we only grind the meat once. Only once? Only once.